Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Brussels Airport. Local time is 3.27 p.m. and the temperature is 17 degrees Celsius. Please notice that we are three minutes early, so the next time we are three hours late, we'll just call it even. We hope you enjoy your visit at the University of Brussels, and thank you for flying Ride to Taxi Airlines. Dr. Massimo Pandolfo, thanks so much for your time and joining me this morning to discuss FA research. Uh, where are you at right now? So thank you for the invitation. First of all, I'm really happy to have this uh, this kind of interaction uh, with, uh, with the FA community. Where I am, I am in Brussels. I am home in Brussels. I work from home this afternoon. It's afternoon here. Uh, that's where I was. That, the, the, this, this is part of the Italian Alps where I was uh, uh, this summer. Okay. So, fake. So uh, tell us the name of your institution and what you do there. Yes, sure. So I have been, uh, so during my professional life, I moved uh, through different institutions. Uh, and uh, since 2001, I'm in Brussels, where uh, I have a clinical appointment at the uh, Brussels Free University, uh, University Hospital, which is called Erasm. And uh, I also have uh, teaching uh, responsibilities with the university, and I also have <clears throat> a small research lab. Okay. And so how do you view your institution's role in the overall ethic community? Um, and like, how, how many patients do you see, for example? Okay, so um, in terms of patients, uh, I have, not a very large number. Now I'm probably following less than 60 patients. Uh, but you have to, to understand the, the, con the, the context uh, uh, because uh, my institution is based uh, in a small country that has about 10 and a half million uh, population, which is, no, I don't know, less than, less than, a, than, a, than a New York metropolitan area probably, and that's the whole country. And uh, more than half of the country is actually uh, Dutch speaking, Flemish speaking, and uh, the other little less than half is French speaking, and I am in a French speaking institution. So actually our uh, collection area, if I may call it that way, of patients uh, is probably less than 5 million people. And so uh, I think I could probably get the vast majority of the FA patients in, in that area, and also I have patients from, uh, from a few from France. So they usually go to the French uh, to, to, to the French specialized sites, but I do have I of course have Flemish speaking patients as well, and uh, and I got over time patients from distant places <laughs> from Moldova to Greece and wow. Cyprus. Yeah. So, um, no. So the, what, what languages do you speak? So uh, the, with our patients, uh, we speak French, of course. That's, that's the working language in my institution. Of course, I speak English. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, Italian, which is my native language. And that's why I have this accent. So now, my, my, what are our roles? So we have uh, this group of patients uh, that, we, um, that, we, that I've been starting to collect in a way and following since I arrived there but about when it was about 10 years since uh, since my arrival in Brussels so we finally managed to get funding from the European Commission to set up a, a network of clinical and research sites in Europe called the EFAX European Friedrich Ataxia Consortium for Translational Studies of which I see ever since been the uh, coordinator so we started doing uh, some more structured work, if you wish, uh, consisting in a regular follow-up and filling up the data, you know, creating, setting up a database, uh, something very similar to what is, is being done in the U.S. by uh, what is called FACOM, the, the FACOM study, you know, the, and the, the right. collaborative uh, group that you have there. Um, so we have included uh, in, in you know, in the overall, in the overall uh, EFATS uh, clinical database and network, now about a thousand patients 
uh, from many different uh, European countries, from the UK, Ireland, uh, Belgium, uh, Germany, France, uh, Austria, Italy, and Greece, uh, and Spain. So uh, we have, uh, we estimate that we may have included probably maybe one third of the European patients that we could wow. have. Before moving to, to, to Brussels, uh, lab work uh, was my main uh, uh, activity. It has become sort of, uh, you know, clinical work has taken a lot of places since I've been here. So, uh, but we still have a lab. I still have a lab. I have three people working in the lab. And uh, the, our main focus has now in shifted toward the two uh, cellular models in particular. Uh, developing models uh, uh, from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. We cool. can change this wow. pluripotent cells into into cell types that may be of, of, of interest, and particularly recently into those sensory neurons that are particularly vulnerable in effect. Maybe maybe you should uh, know that I'm sort of at the end of this experience in Brussels because because of compulsory retirement. Uh, I don't want to retire, I want to continue my work, uh, in particular my work on FA, and I will be moving to Canada soon. Wow, so, that's exciting. You'll be close, man, right, up, right across the border, huh? Yeah, the border is closed for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. We'll have to wait till it opens back up. But. Uh, yeah. So, um, but I, I will leave. You know, I think uh, I think work in, in in this institution will continue because, as I said, there are people who are younger, much younger than me, both on the clinical and on the research side, that have been uh, very much interested and developing strong interest for FA. So basically, the activity as an IFAX site and, and and some lab research will continue in Brussels even even after after I will move a bit away. So you mentioned you've been in this game for a long time. Um, obviously, you love what you do or you wouldn't still be here. Um, why do you love what you do? Why do I love what I do? Uh, let's put it this way. When I was, uh, you know, when I was in medical school, I really had no... Uh, I kind of developed over time uh, uh, sort of what, what I was interested in. And uh, I was kind of, first I discovered neurology because when I was doing a rotation in, in, in internal medicine, I was seeing uh, the neurologist coming for consultation in the hospital. And I saw, the, oh, wow, this is, this is really cool. This is what I would like to do. Uh, you know, when I started my neurology training, I also started doing some, uh, some lab research. And, uh, and I ended up in the lab uh, of Stefano Di Donato in Milan. And Stefano uh, had been involved with a number of other Italians uh, in, uh, in the very first uh, efforts uh, to work uh, on FA, uh, mostly in, 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 in Montreal by the group, uh, by, you know, André Barbeau, you may know André Barbeau as uh, the professor in Montreal, and of course, uh, Claude Saint-Jean. He had, he had FA and, and he really moved the, the world <laughs> in order to yeah. find someone who could, uh, who could uh, get, be interested in his, in his condition and, and, and try to do research and, and move toward a, a cure. Unfortunately, Claude St. John passed away now around 15 years ago. So, uh, but, but, you know, that, and, and this group there uh, and the group of neurologists and researchers that were kind of mobilized by his initiative uh, included many other you know, people from other countries, including a number of Italians. And that's how my mentor at that time got involved with FA. And so he was doing research uh, on FA in Milan when I started training, and so I got interested in FA as well, and uh, started seeing patients, and, and also started doing some lab work at that time, which was biochemistry. You know, we had no molecular genetics sufficiently developed. That was why I think because that's that's what I found as a passion. You know, in terms of uh, I was sufficiently motivated to. Uh, uh, to do medicine, but I also uh, could not imagine of uh, just uh, 
not getting involved in trying to understand the new things to uh, to, you know to solve problems and uh, and I must say that scientific curiosity played uh, played a very large role, <laughs> meaning that of yeah. course there is the motivation of helping people, uh, but also the, there was a lot of scientific curiosity. I cannot deny that. You're right. I understand. Yeah. All right. So you are the guy that discovered the gene for FA. Um, and so can you tell us about that? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I want to, to, to put things right. That was a collective effort okay, in which I was not absolutely not alone. And I think it was an, uh, I had in particular, Michel Koenig in France who was, was really uh, we we really worked uh, together in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, to to get to get this gene you know to get this accomplished. I started this work in Italy mm -hmm. and, and then I moved to Baylor College of Medicine. To make a long story short, uh, uh, we uh, we decided to to collaborate closely with a group in Strasbourg and with Michel Koenig and with other groups, uh, uh, particularly in Spain and in Italy. And we ended up found this, this gene uh, that was right sitting there in the region where the gene had to be. <laughs> uh, but we could not find mutations. Wow. You know, we were looking for mutations, so the regular mutations, you know, what right. we now, you know, like high deletions, point mutation, and this kind of thing, we couldn't find. And let me tell you this, this detail that Sanjay B. Tishandani, that you may know, Yes, of course. Was in the lab at that time. He was not working with me. He was working with someone else, a pragmatel, papatel. But he got, you know, kind of interested in this effort. And he said, well, let me help you. And uh, I have learned a technique to uh, detect a mutation that involves the amplification of RNA, okay, or the transcript of the gene. Okay. And uh, so we started, you know, taking you know, white blood cells from patient and amplifying the DNA, you know, get, trying to extract the RNA uh, from this, from this uh, cells to apply this technique that Sanjay wanted to use to detect mutations. And what happened is that we found out that patients had less of this RNA. So even if you didn't find mutations, we, we found out that this gene was expressed at the lower level. Mm. So we started asking why, you know, maybe, maybe it is, and at that time we had an example of a fragile X, which was also a repeat expansion, whose result was of suppressing the expression of the gene. And so we thought maybe this thing makes it something similar. And we did an experiment in which we looked at uh, essentially some changes in DNA material. Well, let's put it this way, we did an experiment thinking that this might be looking looking like fragile x and we this experiment showed the repeat expansion mm. so i immediately told michelle in france who of course didn't believe me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after after a few days he really did believe me and confirmed that they were finding the expansion in patients there as well and uh, within uh, you know, in a short time, and we ended up finding the GA repeat, uh, making sure that it was the GA repeat, uh, and then we, uh, you know, and, and, and then that was it. Well, Dr. Pandolfo, thank you for joining me for this conversation today, and thank you for all your work in the FA community. We are so appreciative of your service. Okay, thank you, and I hope that we will meet in person again uh soon <laughs> yep know. i hope so too yeah maybe in canada all right thank you thank you